you do? I'm Bill. How do you do? I'm Bill Myers. I worked as an actuary for Independent Life and Accident Insurance Company, for American Merchant Life Insurance Company, and in the Florida Department of Insurance. Some years ago, uh, from approximately 1981 till about 20 years afterwards, and since then, I've been working in a variety of professions, whether it academia, um, customer service, retail, and um, uh, as a, a, in working for uh, nonprofits and like. And so I'm honored to be here today to discuss the actuarial profession as a helping profession. And I eagerly look forward to hearing what you all have to ask or bring up and to learn myself more about how the actuarial profession is operating in the current day and age. So with that, I look forward to hearing your questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bill. We appreciate that. Um, everyone, welcome. Uh, I have too many tabs open. Let's see. We have about just under 30 folks in here right now. Um, if you've been here before, you all know that you can put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we will answer them as they come through. <clears throat> Excuse me. So to get us started, Bill, you know, the title of this session is Actuarial Science as a Helping Profession. So what does that mean to you? What does it mean to you about it being a helping profession? To me, it means that the actuarial profession can help address not just the wants of uh, people that it services, but the needs more importantly. Um, we would all agree that life insurance, health insurance, um, uh, annuities, uh, investments, these all represent in some context or another needs that we come across of in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, social security, um, especially for some of our younger members, you may have questions concerning the solvency of the social security trust fund. Very excellent question in regards to whether you um, have concerns about that. Actuaries work a great deal in providing, uh, in working to see how we can shore up the uh, social security and uh, not unrelated Medicare trust funds. So uh, it's a phenomenal profession. And also very importantly, it gives individuals whether they are in academia, whether they work for the government, as well as the private sector opportunities to advance their significant math skills, which um, you must have a significant math skills in order to be an actuary. So for those of you practicing in that way, congratulations on your success. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> excuse me, I have lost my voice as winter is starting now. <laughs> oh my. My apartment is kind of dry. So apologies. Bear with me with that. No apologies <clears throat> necessary. So, folks, again, we can go ahead and get our uh, questions in here. Bill, I know a question that everyone likes to ask is sure. Did you ever fail an exam when you were studying for your ASA? I sure did. I, I am being completely honest, I think that I probably took longer in order to get my associateship than any other associate in the Society of Actuaries. It took me 12 years in order to get my associateship. Uh, when I'm a little bit full of myself, I say, Bill, way to persevere. But in candor, there were times where I probably should have used my time a lot better when I was practicing uh, studying for the exams. Thank you. And so how do you have any study tips? I know that you went through the associateship uh, pathway a while ago, but if you have any study tips you can share, I think our participants would love to hear that. I'd be glad to. Uh, at the time that I entered the actuarial profession, I was a I was a senior in college. I took my first actuarial exam in November of 1980 couple of other buddies of mine who were also math majors 
and I were um, decided we had heard about this actuarial profession and wanted to see hmm, what can we do in order to maybe consider a career in this. And so um, it helps to find a really good professor, very good math professor that you might have um, a good rapport with, especially um, who um, may be able to provide some kind of, if, you're, if your school does not provide an actuarial science major or courses, uh, some kind of interdepartmental, which that's how I was able to take my interdepartmental, uh, take my first actuarial exam. Um, and uh, that was very beneficial um, just to, uh, you know, you could get feedback from the professor while you are uh, taking this course. You know, the preparation is part of what's required to do well in the course, the, the college course, not the exam per se, but it obviously benefits you in regards to the exam as well. So I would definitely look for um, a good professor uh, who may and, and see what they can do to possibly assist. That was very beneficial to me. Uh, when it comes to while you're working as an actuary or an, as an actuarial intern, I would definitely look to, um, well, the rule of thumb, at least back then, I wouldn't be surprised if it's somewhat similar now, is that for every hour of exam time, you need to study 80 to 100 hours on your own. Now, many companies, they give you opportunities to study on the job and if you are fortunate enough to be working with one of those companies, I'm very happy for you. Um, but um, I would say that definitely uh, that's something that you really need to take advantage of because if you don't put in the time, you're not going to pass the actuarial exam and you spend all that time for what? Nothing. Uh, so that's those would be the two primary recommendations I would make from that's my own nice. experience. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think that those definitely apply still today with our folks who are looking for those jobs and those internships. That's all awesome. right. So we are getting some questions. Thank you all so much. Bill, can you describe a time you felt your work had a direct positive impact on people? Yes. Um, there was a time where... Um, we had these annuities that, uh, especially for those that involve life contingencies, that it was kind of difficult to determine what the tax implications are, especially if they were non-qualified annuities, uh, how to determine um, the taxable portion of each payment, because you know part of it is going to be return of what you invested in it. The rest has to be what you um, um, what you owe in, in in taxes and so of each payment and when you're dealing with an annuity with life contingencies that's not the easiest thing to figure out because at the time you don't know how long you're going to live so um, so I uh, used a wonderful resource a book called tax facts um, now I don't know if now that might be uh, involved in computers, there might be computer um, uh, programs in order to set this up. Um, but still in all, it's probably a good idea if tax facts still exist in order to provide this resource. You never know if you're going to get the mother of all hackers or something like that, and just to be able to have that experience knowing how. And so make a long story short, when it came time to report the taxable portions, I was able to take a form and inscribe on the form a the outline of an actual uh, tax form that the person would receive at the end of the year so that instead of going through a bunch of columns that showed this was how much they received and this was how much was taxable and a lot of other uh, information, it said to the person who was receiving the annuity exactly how much was taxable and made made their tax year go a little bit smoother hopefully so I think that was something I felt really good about 
Thank you for sharing that. And I found the most recent, the 2023 tax facts, and I put that in the chat for folks if you're interested in looking into that. Awesome. Glad to know that they still have tax yes. facts around. That's a wonderful resource. <laughs> yes. yeah. All right. Um, our next question is, I have a political science education and have worked in the health insurance industry in a Medicare compliance capacity. I'm currently back in university working on my actuarial science degree. I was wondering if there are any roles actuaries can provide within the U.S. Department of State. I would love to utilize my math skills in consulting on U.S. foreign policy. Are you and are you aware of any actuarial political opportunities? That's a great question. Um, on the surface, I don't know per se of what would be available, but that's not to say that there wouldn't be. I can tell you what you might want to consider is looking for think tanks, um, think tanks that um, may be able to use um, uh, your significant math skills and your other skills, um, you know, a variety of, you know, let me just say this, that if you have passion for what you believe in, that carries a great amount of, of good. If you can show to whoever, um, uh, you're applying that you really have a passion for something like that, that in a lot of instances carries a lot more weight than just your uh, black and white um, uh, uh, resume and uh, uh, grade point average. People want to see what are you going to do in order to set yourself apart uh, from the other applicants for a particular position. And so if you can use your passion for um, uh, for actuarial science, for coming up with items that have um, excellent, um, uh, that relate to foreign policy and the like, um, that would be beneficial um, when it comes to uh, one matter. Now, in regards to government, I was thinking about, um, we all know and have heard about climate change and um and that would be a significant, uh, significant type of issue. Um, I remember seeing problems where suppose you're a company that needs to um, that needs to show compliance with a particular uh, environmental law, and you have certain uh, smokestacks, for instance. If um, and they say we need this. Um, using max min problems and calculus and the like could be very beneficial to see how you can minimize the direct impact to your company's bottom line while complying with the necessary uh, regulations that the jurisdiction puts out there. So that might be one, one item. Thank you very much. And I love the, the idea of looking at think tanks. I, I wouldn't even think that there would be actuaries involved in think tanks, but of course there are because actuaries exist wherever risk exists so thank you yes absolutely i appreciate right. that Our, go ahead i you know i i i had one opportunity when i was working for the florida department of insurance in tallahassee i remember thinking that there was a think tank available uh in tallahassee that i thought this sounds interesting and it goes into um fields that I felt comfortable with and I just decided to take a look at it but at the time they were not really looking for the opportunities but you know that doesn't mean that there aren't at certain points and so um so I think that's what caused that to pop to my mind thank you we appreciate that You're all bad. right our next question <clears throat> I think a lot of people view insurance companies as evil institutions. Even though they provide services that people need, health insurance companies are very aggressive in trying to pay as little claims as possible to their customers. Are there ways actuaries can assist customers with this, or is this an issue with upper management or a different department? I would say working in the Florida Department of Insurance, there's an old saying, perception is reality. And the Florida had a reputation, I don't know if it still does, had a reputation for being one of the most stringent states in the union in regards to protecting consumer rights against 
uh, against insurance companies that may be trying to. So a lot depends upon what state um, you're in. Now, granted, I was in that area before um, uh, the Affordable Care Act became the law of the land. And so it's changed quite a bit. I can tell you that one thing I'm very happy to see, though, in regards to what's available in the private marketplace, to your point, in regards to uh, companies that are um, maybe predatory, trying to find ways to take advantage of customers, is long-term care. Um, this is a very, very significant policy offering. Um, I can't tell you how much more secure I feel and my family feels by having long-term care insurance policies. You know, it's, um, you, you may say this is a case where uh, uh, the cook is eating his own cooking. I, we, we feel a lot better about it because really for seniors and especially with some of the dementia that um, has existed in my family and the like, and my wife's family, um, uh, it's nice to know that there are policies out there. They're not as plentiful as they used to be, but there are policies out there that um, that provide some protection from possibly going bankrupt in your senior years. And I think that's a major policy offering. So um, that's why I would share in regards to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Our next question is, I have a BS degree in finance and working at a global broker. I'm currently working on preparing medical claims analysis and premium projections and interested to have an actuarial certificate. How can I begin and what are the recommended courses to start? I would definitely look at what kind of um, actuarial directories there might be in your area, depending upon where you live. Um, and in regards to, you know, you're, you're being a finance major, I, I don't know if, if you feel any um, question concerning, um, uh, gee, I, I wonder if, if this is okay that I'm not a math major or something like that. I would not let that bother you. Uh, I know of one person who became a fellow of the Society of Actuary who never took, who never took um, uh, academic math beyond algebra. He was a he was a, a music major, and he went on to get his FSA, one of the smartest people. So, you know, if you've got that drive, more power to you. Um, I would say that. Um, check out the directories, check out local universities, see if they have an actuarial science, check with the Society of Actuaries. Brianna, you've been, you and the Society of Actuaries have been wonderful in providing me with resources in regards to uh, how to promote the actuarial science profession. So I would, I would check on all those and, and, and others who you may know are already in the actuarial science. Word of mouth is, is wonderful. I once got a job just um, going to a high school football game and seeing a guy I know, uh, I knew from high school, um, and he happened to be working with another insurance company at the time. And this was after I had just lost my job with Independent Life. And a month or two later, I'm working for his company. And so, you know, you got to get out there. And I know technology is great and wonderful, but um, don't don't discount the human touch. I'd say. Thank you so much. And I dropped the link to the uh, SOA's uh, actuarial directory. So it's the directory of all of our members in the world. And so awesome. folks, as long as you, I believe you have to be an affiliate member to access it. I'm not sure if it's open to everyone. If you click the link, you should be able to tell, but you can go in there, put in your zip code and you can see all of the actual, all of our members who are in your area. And we sure. definitely recommend, you know, you know, cold calling is what it used to be. Now it's cold emailing, but just sending out an email to folks who you are interested in, whether it's for an internship or a job shadow opportunity, or just to chat about what a day in the life is like at their, in, or at their company. So definitely a wonderful resource, Bill. Thank you for um, suggesting well, that. Well, thank you so much for sharing with me. I appreciate it. Of course. All right. And our next question is, do you have any advice uh, for how to prepare for a second interview for an entry-level PNC actuarial analyst? 
That's a great question. Of uh, the vast majority of my actuarial experience was when was in life and health. I attempted at some point, you know, in a in a way to try to get um, a little bit more well-rounded, possibly uh, in the actuarial science. Uh, I ventured into property and casualty. Um, my best answer to that would be. If you happen to know anybody in the PNC industry right now, try to get with them. You know, I'm I'm not a good source for PNC information, especially I have very little experience in regards to that. But um, uh, it used to be. Well, I can tell you as far as the PNC and life and health actuaries uh, actuarial exams, they used to have like the first two exams in common, I think, but I wouldn't be surprised if they've gone off in different directions at this point. But but something that you can tell them during the second, second session is that you realize the importance of property and casualty uh, uh, to the extent that um, the independent, um, that the company I worked for, there were... Um, there were tie-ins, let's say, I'm not sure how much, but tie-ins between what happened to our whole company and the impact from Hurricane Andrew in 1992. That was a significant uh, harm to our uh, group operations. And, and so, um, so if nothing else, you can emphasize how important, um, how important PNC matters are from from that standpoint, not just on PNC industry, but the whole whole gamut. Thank you. And we just got another question similar. Um, some there, this person is currently looking for an actuarial job. Do you have any interview tips? Yes. First off, be yourself. Uh, it seems trite, but it really is true. Uh, people can spot phonies if if they feel like you're buttering them up. Um, research the company. I would definitely not mention anything about money. Um, best advice I ever got when I was looking for actuarial opportunities was a close friend of my mother's said, Bill, don't go for the company that offers you the most pay. Go for the company that gives you the most opportunities to grow. And that was wonderful advice. Um, if It just instinctively sent, puts in the mind of the employer. Um, they're more interested in the pay than in the challenges of the position. Um, show what you can do for them. Tell them what you're willing to do. Do something in order to set yourself apart. Um, that to me would be the best thing that, that you could do. Um, uh, get, um, look up good resources as far as getting your resume in, in good working order. Um, be sure to be very uh, polite to any uh, references that you may have that you're looking to uh, use as references for your job. Anything that they do whatsoever, be sure to thank them and and tie that in with how anything that they might have done ties in specifically to something that could have been beneficial to your being offered a job. Thank you. And that is uh, that advice from your mom's friend is wonderful. And I've heard iterations of that, but that is so important. It's you got to look at everything, not just the bottom, the salary number. So thank you very much for that. My pleasure. Yeah. And um, for our attendees, I just dropped the link to our free affiliate membership program that we have. And <clears throat> excuse me, as Bill mentioned, you know, make sure you, you know, you have folks looking over your resume, you know how to write it. Uh, we have some e-learning modules on there that go over resume tips, as well as interview tips and some other, like, I think communication skills as well. So definitely check those out if you're not already an affiliate member with us. All right, Bill. Our next question is, I'm a junior computer science undergraduate student with a strong passion for actuaries and a focus on machine learning and AI. 
I'm curious about the level of diversification in the field of actuaries. How often do actuaries collaborate with technical consultants, data scientists, and machine learning experts? And how has their role been evolving and increasing in significance within the field of actuarial science, especially with the growing prominence of AI and data analysis? The best way I know how to answer that is regards to my father's own experience. My father before me had worked as an actuary and he worked for Life of Virginia back in the 1960s. Now, I promise you there's a point to this. He was at Life of Virginia at the time where computers were just getting started and we had those punch cards and that sort of thing. Well, um, Life of Virginia purchased this huge computer uh, from IBM. It was so big, they had to knock out three stories out of the Life of Virginia building in downtown Richmond just in order to get it in. And my father was an actual student at the time in Richmond. And his boss turned to my father and said, uh, Paul, can you do something about this? And, uh, and my dad, not missing a wink, said, well, does it come with instructions? Because nobody knew much about computers in those days. This was early 1960s. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. And he gave it to him. Well, the next three days, my father worked on computer, worked on his computer and got it running so perfectly that it was up and running and everybody in the building gave me outstanding applause. So why am I bringing this up? My father took over the computer operations and wound up solving, um, you, you know, what the Y2K issue was that was all the rage in the early uh, or late 1990s, early 2000s. I'm like, my father solved all of the um, uh, Y2K issues for Life of Virginia back in the 1960s because of his computer expertise. And he was able to take that and go to a wonderful computer-based, um, IT-based um, work assignment with what was then Bowles and Tellinghast in Atlanta, a consulting actuarial firm, and made lots of connections. So there's definitely quite a bit of connection between uh, between the IT and uh, industry and uh, and actuarial science. Um, so I would say pursue that some of the other uh, parts that you mentioned and that I, I'm not a hundred percent sure about as far as what, what the connection might be, but, you know, check it out and, and see what, um, see what can be accomplished in that. And that's, that's the best I know how to answer that. Thank you. I love that because Again, as someone, I was born in 1991, so I grew up with the Y2K crisis looming okay. as, as a child. So oh, that's everybody really, was freaking out about it, right? Yeah, it was, <laughs> I told that you, is so that, that yeah, was, that's so cool to hear that your father was able to preemptively solve some of those issues. <laughs> it, it was it was wonderful. I was he was I I, I never knew uh, what a genius he was when it comes to computers until you know, later on in life and everything. So, um, you know, I have to tip my hat to him because he was, he was really a genius when it came to that. And he was passionate about it. And there you go to that passion. And, you know, the questioner obviously has that same type of passion. So more power to you. Thank you. All right. You Our next question is, obviously job satisfaction will depend on the specific environment and the specific people you work with. But what personality traits or other factors would you say are generally important to thrive within the actuary profession? Curiosity. Um, you will probably find a wealth of information at your disposal, uh, the transactions of the Society of Actuaries. And there's going to come, and right now, to be honest with you, I'm thinking a little bit of filings I used to get when I was with the... Um, uh, Florida Department of Insurance that dealt with um, uh, rate filings for accidental death uh, filings. And, you know, I was, you know, a rates analyst uh, for the for the Florida Department of Insurance. And taking a look at the uh, at the uh, transactions, there's multitude of studies that deal with uh, the things that go into the pricing of um, 
of um, of uh, say um, uh, accidental death benefits of uh, filings and like, and it's a uh, and from from such things as um, uh, anywhere from suicide to drug abuse to uh, walking across uh, um, uh, hit and run traffic, um, a variety of different contingencies. And that was very beneficial as far as saying, okay, is what this company is saying in their filing, does that make sense? And is that a legitimate? And so I would take advantage of the transactions and the wealth of information that you have at your hand. Um, I would say too, um, don't be afraid to offer help if you see somebody else that can, you can make great friends in this profession um, and, uh, uh, and, and realize, try to keep a glass is half full rather than half empty. When I, when I look back at my career and think I, I was so silly about this when I was, when I was starting, I mistakenly felt like this company that this was the way companies generally operated because this was my first experience with a insurance company. I said, well, this must be the way things are. And I never realized while I was there, how fortunate I was to be working for independent life. They were a phenomenal company to work for and great bunch of, of, of people, um, great bunch of opportunities. And, and, and I might, and, and this needs to be said, I think the actuarial profession is wonderful in regards to professions as far as even being ahead of its time and promoting opportunities for, for minorities of all types. Um, it, it should never matter anyway how a person identifies um, in their life, but uh, you know, can you do the work? It's, it's so basic, it's so fundamental. And that's one great thing about the actual profession is that it's very objective in nature. Yes, we make predictions, but it's still um, using objective data in order to determine how do you price these things? How do you load things? So on and so forth. So it's a great profession in that respect. Thank you. Sure. Great. Our next question is, <clears throat> I have a PhD in math and I'm registered to take exam P this month. I'm thinking of also taking the next exam FM. I teach math at the college level and would like to create a mathematical fi mathematical finance program as a possible concentration within the major. I'm looking to gain some credentials in this area, but may not be able to seek an official degree in finance. Do you know of any online courses, free or not, related to actuary prep or additional exams that would look good on a CV or make one stand out? That's a great question. Um, I would say good for you for looking for resources and for not presuming that in spite of the fact that you have these advanced degrees, it's not a slam dunk. These are these exams are challenging for everybody. Uh, and so uh, the more resources you can find, I would say see if there's any other uh, individuals in your PhD program, in, um, in any of the contacts that you've made from past work that have taken anything like these exams that might have, um, I know I didn't pass my part two exam in probability and statistics. That's what it was at the time that I passed it. Probably that was part two. That was back in the early 1980s. Uh, until I got a, um, a wonderful resource from my buddy uh, from Washington Lee who had already passed part two uh, that we had sat for exams before. And he had it broken down as far as, um, as, far as uh, uh, normal distribution, students T uh, distributions, uh, so on and so forth, how to determine the mean, the variance, et cetera and how to apply those in an actuarial context. And that was a huge benefit to me. So you're smart to try to find that resource. You might wanna consider going to your, um, 
uh, to your library where you do most of your research work possibly and see if there are or or any of your professors and and see you know show them your interest in 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 trying to find extra ways in order to master the material I lost my unmute button there. Um, thank you oh. very much. That is helpful. And I would also say uh, Jason is who asked this question. Jason, there are a lot of um, companies. The one that comes to mind immediately is coaching actuaries. So their, their whole, everything that they do is to help folks study for and pass the exams. So I would also uh, reach out to them and ask these questions. You know, they might have some ideas of, how to parlay what you've done. Obviously you have a PhD in math, so you know your stuff. Um, they might be able to help you parlay that and uh, translate it to a CV. Um, something that I'm glad you said that. Um, uh, does McGill University still offer? Um, they're, they're based in Ontario, Canada, I believe. And they had a wonderful actuarial science program. And I think that they used to provide materials and Georgia State University is considered, you know, from your Atlanta connection, but but you don't have to be from Atlanta to, to know that that was a wonderful um, actuarial science. Uh, they, they may both provide such resources that could be beneficial. Yes, and I know Georgia State has uh, things. We actually just had a, an event with them Oh, two great. weeks ago. So I'm very familiar <laughs> with the Georgia State stuff. So yeah, definitely um, right. check them out. And Jason, if you want to send me an email, I'll put my email in the chat. I can help connect you with some of those resources as well. Excellent. Something else I thought of just now, any of the actuarial textbooks, something that was very beneficial to me when I was taking my part four, um, actuarial mathematics, there was a variety of co-authors and I had the privilege of talking with one of them. Um, his name was uh, Professor Cecil Nesbitt from the University of Michigan. Uh, he was one of six co-authors and I had a question concerning one of the illustrations in the actual um, mathematics textbook, which that was a textbook for not just the uh, life contingencies exam, but also risk theory exam. And he was very helpful. So uh, consider reaching out to other professors of some of the textbooks that you may have too, if they have contact information. Yeah, that's awesome. That is so cool that you were able to reach out to him. He was awesome. He was awesome. And you know, I my 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 hat's off to him. He was great. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Our next question is what is something you wish you would have known when you first started becoming an actuary or something you wish you would have focused more on? I, I slightly alluded to it um, a little while ago, just realizing what a special company independent life was for me to work there and not just thinking that that was a standard actuarial science environment. It, that, that was a wonderful, wonderful company, wonderful opportunity. Um, I wish that I had known a bit earlier about the actuarial profession. Um, my mom, God bless her, she, she was wonderful in helping me make connections with uh, some of the upper management at Prudential while I was looking for actuarial work. But I had gotten to be a, a senior at Washington Lee and I, I honestly thought that, you know, I was looking to become a teacher, which I wound up being a teacher for a little while and stuff. And then, you know, these opportunities for actuarial science worked out. And, and, and I felt like, you know, that was a great opportunity. So um, the uh, uh, if one could find a way, and, and Brianna, I must applaud you on this uh, when in our initial discussions, talking about reaching out to even middle school students and, and high school students, I think that makes so much sense because by the time you're a senior in college, it's probably been a few years since you took the material that is most prevalent on the initial or entry level actuarial exam. I know it was for me. It had been like four years since I had taken 
uh, calculus that was so much a part of part one. And so if you can get started at an earlier age, um, it really makes sense. You know, if, 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 if we have high school students who are able to go straight to the NBA to play basketball, why can't, why can't high school math geniuses, you know, uh, look to, you know, start off in an actuarial career while they're still in high school. That makes perfect sense to me, especially with life, um, uh, life work balances. You know, the sooner there's a ton of exams, the sooner you can get the exams over with, the more time you can devote to the things that you enter the profession to, you know, you want to support a family, you want to have time, the sooner you can do that, uh, the better, the better it is. And that's, uh, so, you know, I, you know, I applaud you, Brianna, I applaud the society for, for promoting earlier opportunities to get into the actual science profession. Thank you. I appreciate that. We are trying our best uh, to get into it's those awesome. middle schools. Yeah. That's great. So, all right. We have two more questions and I know we are slightly over time, so let's get through these two. Um, okay. All right. So this person says, and I identify with them, sort of, I'm really good at math, but I'm bad at writing exams, especially final exams. I've written P twice and failed because I'm not the best at studying and I do much better in class. For example, when you can talk to your professor and classmates, I feel like actually joining the field might help me. I've gotten an internship lined up for next fall, but I'm not sure. Based on this experience, I feel like it might not, it might also take me a long time to complete my ASA. Do you have any advice on this? And how did you ever feel like giving up at any point? And how did you handle that? Great question. Um, yes, there were times where I felt like I felt sometimes that uh, it might be that decision might be made on my behalf by my employer, because, you know, 12 years is an awful long time to take to get your to get your associateship. What I would say, my very last exam that was by far my best. And there's a point to this. Um, it was the only exam I ever took that I got a 10 on. And I hope that they still have the same, you know, zero to 10 uh, grade scale now. And it was because some, some of them were saying, Bill, you know, you're just taking this 10 credit exam. Why don't you consider taking a fellowship exam with it? At that point, it was so important to me to get that associateship that I didn't want to take any so try not to bite off more than you can chew. You know better than anyone um, what time commitments you have, what's important to you and the like. But if it's just, this is the entry level exam, I would just do everything you possibly can and try to, and surround yourself with positive thinking people. The more you can surround yourself with positive thinking people, I know I had a neighbor who said, Bill, I think I believe in you more than you believe in yourself. That was very beneficial to me because, and, and I, my wife supported me after we met, you know, I started passing the exams at a little bit better rate, which was good for my uh, family and like. So, so it's very, very important to, uh, to do that. So that's what I would say. Thank you so much. And again, community is everything. No one is on this exam pathway alone. And exactly. so folks, if you're in here and you feel like you're alone, you have at least two people with Bill and I, and you can reach out to us and we will help however we can and um, support however we can. But that is that is such a powerful thing, that community piece. So thank you so much Amen. for sharing that. And that um, the praise that you got from your neighbor is wonderful and heartwarming. It really is. It takes such a little, you know, it's just common sense, I think, you know, thank you. Thank you. All right. And for our final question, as far as the field of life and health is concerned, would you prefer jobs working for large insurance corporations or jobs working for consultancy firms? Definitely large companies over consulting firms. Um, it's, I think for me, it helps manage the uh, time life continuum better um, work work life continuum better uh, in that um, it, it, it's the old you 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 may make more and be able to retire by the time you're 50 if you go the consulting route if that's what you want to do but 
you know, a person wrote an excellent article that, you know, we're we're blessed to have in our family a a child who is moderately special needs, and we were able to, through no small part through some of the benefits I received from my actuarial profession, uh, be able to put them through certain private schools and and uh, and went to college and now he is doing phenomenally well with his job and to see that at that point some people say well i'm going to leave a million dollars for my um for my heirs when i die or whatever if you die at a normal age of like 75 or 80 your heirs are probably 50 55 60 they've already established their life whatever why not provide them when they can use it most during their upbringing and stuff and give them a chance to realize the dream that you've been so blessed to, to receive yourself. So that's what I would say to that. Bill, thank you so much. This was an absolutely wonderful session. Um, thank you thank so you. much to everyone who attended. Uh, this will this recording will be up in the next few days, depending on how YouTube decides to uh, handle our video request. But everyone have a great day and happy November. Thank you so very much for the opportunity. Thank you all for your excellent questions. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.